Hello, my name is Kevin Large and I'd like to welcome you to the 10th in our series of IoT Security Raspberry Pi emulation videos. In this 10th foundational video we'll be looking at services, that's network services, for instance Telnet and FTP, DHCP, SSH, <laughs> uh, Nmap, so we'll be using Nmap from the Kali Linux virtual machine and also Wireshark from the Kali Linux virtual machine. We'll be making use of the topology that we used in foundational video number 9 where we've got our sandboxed network environment. So we'll have our Kali Linux VM going through the VirtualBox host only adapter into the Windows bridge. Uh, we'll only make use of one node in this, particular, this video, so we'll only use node 1 going through Windows Tap Adapter VME01 into the Windows bridge. Uh, I'm not going to bother taking the other ones off, I'm just only going to start node 1 and uh, we'll uh, go with that. Before you start node 1 you want to make sure that you've got uh, your Kali Virtual Machine up and running and the DHCP service running on it. So I've already started the Kali Linux machine to save a bit of time. I'll now log in with the user root and the password of Tor. Now of course it goes without saying the Kali Linux machine is set to use the host only adapter, VirtualBox host only Ethernet adapter. Once your Kali Linux machine has loaded up, we need to switch on the DHCP server. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the terminal. And I can do that by uh, left clicking on the terminal icon over here. I'll maximize the terminal. But what I'll do is I'll maximize Kali Linux as well by using con right control F to go full screen. Just gives us that little bit more desktop real estate. Um, if I do an IPA we can see that uh, I've got the usual IP address of 203.0.113.1 I can hit control L to clear the screen um, if I have a quick look using cat at the ETC network interfaces file uh, you can see why we've got that static IP address. This was already set up in the Oracle VirtualBox appliance that we downloaded from the Cisco website and imported into Oracle VirtualBox. Um, it's simply a matter now of starting up the DHCP server. Before starting up the DHCP server we can check the status by typing in service isc dhcp service status and that should give us the output indicating that the server is currently inactive. If we change the word status to start, this will start the ISC DHCP server. And now we can check the status again and we can see that it's active and running. Excellent. Now that the DHCP server is active and running, what we can do is we can start the emulated Raspberry Pi. I'm currently in my downloads folder in the Node 1 directory, so it's only a matter of running my start.bat windows batch file. You can see that this windows batch file is using Windows Tap Adapter with interface name of VME1 with a MAC address of 00150101010011. Kumu is now loading. I'll bring the Kumu window up and I'll minimize some of these other windows. Be extra careful not to close this window. If you close this window, you'll stop Kumu loading. So just minimize it. Also minimize the file manager, the Windows file manager, so we can see the Kali Linux window in the background. Let's see if any leases have been given out already. So I'll just use service ISC DHCP server status. 
Aha, there is a lease that's been given out. 203.0.113.25, that's been given out to desktop 76 HOU42. That's my Windows machine. So effectively, this is the IP address that's been given out to my Windows bridge. Um, let's see if we can prove that. I'll just bring up a command prompt, Windows key R and CMD. I'll do an IP config. So this is on my host machine, the machine that Oracle VirtualBox is running on, that Kali uh, Linux is running in, that Kubu is running on, that I'm recording these videos on. And we should be able to see that the Ethernet adapter network bridge has been given the IP address of 203.0.113.25. So that is this IP address here. Uh, by now we should have found that the Kumu machine has also been given an IP address. Yes indeed there it is 26 has been given out to Kumu RPI 1. Okay so we've already got one service running. We've got a service running however this service is running on the Kali Linux machine DHCP server which is handing out IP addresses to the Windows bridge on my Windows host machine and also to my Kumu emulated Raspberry Pis. I'll now bring up the Kumu emulated Raspberry Pi window and log in with the user Pi and the password of Raspberry which I always tend to type wrong but it looks like I've got it right this time. Let's have a look to see what services are running by default on this Pi. So, ss minus tl. Show sockets, TCP listening. And we can see that we've got HTTP listening, so there's a web server. We've also got uh, SSH listening, so there's a SSH server. So currently there are already two services running on this Raspberry Pi. Um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to type W to show who's logged into this system. Currently we only have a local login on TTY1, uh, so that is this local login here. Yeah. Login via the console, directly locally into the Kumu Raspberry Pi. Um, what I'm going to do now, just to make life that little bit easier, is I'm going to start up PuTTY. So having started up PuTTY, I'm going to type in the IP address of our emulated Raspberry Pi, which should be 203.0.113.26. And we have a PuTTY window open. I'll log in again as Pi with a password of Raspberry. And we're in. It's strange, it actually seems slightly more responsive in the remote window where you're going in through SSH than it does in the local window. Now if I type W now, you'll notice that we've got the local login but we've also now got a remote login from PTS0 uh, from the IP address 203.0.113.25 which is the Windows bridge. So in other words, a putty session running on the Windows machine over here. Okay, so that's all good to go what we'll do now is we'll run another service but before we run that service what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually run nmap against our emulated Raspberry Pi so I'm going to go into the Kali Linux machine I'm going to clear the screen and I'm going to type the command nmap minus a against 203.0.113.26 okay now this takes a few seconds to run in fact it probably easily um, 30 40 50 seconds to run this command however what it does is extremely clever so nmap hyphen a uh, actually uh, makes use of uh, it kind of concatenates several different options uh, it does a very detailed scan. Uh, we can see that uh, we've got port 22 TCP open, 
SSH. It even gives us the version of the SSH server that's running on the emulated Raspberry Pi that it's just scanned. It's OpenSSH 7.9 P1 Raspberry 10. Uh, we've got some keys here, some SSH keys. Um, we've got the web server. The web server is of course running on port 80 TCP. It's the Tornado HTTPD, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Daemon, or HTTP server in other words, 6.0.3. And they are the only two services that are actually currently up and running. And they're only one hop away, so they're effectively they're on the same subnet as us. They're not on the other side of a router or anything like that. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to clear the screen in anticipation of running some more commands in Kali. And then what we will do is use our putty window in order to start another service up. Okay, so I'm just going to expand the putty window slightly and the service that we'll start up will be Telnet. And Telnet is part of what's known as the Internet Super Server. So we have to start the OpenBSD iNetD.service. And we can do that by typing sudo systemctl start openbsd inetd.service We can check the status by changing the word start to status and we can see that the internet super server has started Okay, so this should give us Telnet. How can we check that? Nice and easy. SS minus L or SS minus TL. So we'll focus it down onto TCP listening sockets. And we can see that we also now have Telnet up and running. And of course, if we put TLN, it will show us that it's port 23 that's listening. OK, so we have another service up and running. So of course that means now that if we run the nmap command again, what we should find is we should find that we've got a bit more information. I actually had to pause the video there for a while because that took rather a long time to reply. Uh, must have took two or three minutes for the reply to come back. But it does actually show that Telnet is listening, it is open, um, doesn't give a lot of information about it at the minute, which is kind of unusual. Um, I would have expected that to have actually given us the uh, some idea of the Telnet super server that was running. Probably you would find, if I gave it a minute or two and run that command again, it probably would tell us. Um, but we can see that port 22, port 23 and port 30 are now... Sorry, port 22, 23 and 80 are now all open and listening on the emulated Raspberry Pi, as reported by Nmap on the Kali VM. Uh, what we can do now is we can do something even more interesting. I'm going to clear the screen on the Kali VM and I'm going to start Wireshark. And I'm going to start Wireshark in the background by using the ampersand key. So Wireshark space ampersand. This allows me to still have control of the terminal window. Don't worry about that little error popping up saying about LUA error during loading. That's of no consequence whatsoever. Uh, we can see that on the Ethernet zero interface with its IP address of 203.0.113.1 which is our Windows bridge. Uh, we've got... Uh, oh, sorry, which is our Kali Linux machine, I should say. Um, we've got some... Uh, quite extensive number of packets floating past. We've got ARP packets, we've got spanning tree protocol packets, we've got all kinds of packets floating past. In fact this is a bit of a problem because there's a lot of information going past it we're not really interested in. So what we can do is we can actually make use of a filter now. So the first thing we'll do is we'll look at the IP address on the Kali Linux machine which is 113.1 We'll look at the IP address on our emulated Raspberry Pi. Uh, we can get that 
either directly from the Pi itself or from the SSH session into the Pi. So that is 113.26. And then what we will do is we'll set up a filter. We'll set up what's called a display filter, which we can put in here. OK, and the display filter we're going to use is this one. So we're simply specifying the IP source being 203.0.113.1 .1, space ampersand ampersand the IP destination and what we do is we use a space equals equals space and then the IP address of the destination. So it uh, looks a little bit strange the first time you use one of these but it does kind of make sense. Once we've applied the display filter we can hit the blue arrow and that will filter out any traffic that is not from this source to this destination. OK, that's good. Um, what we'll do is we'll actually prove the fact that uh, we've got the correct source and destination in here by bringing up the Raspberry Pi and we'll fire a ping across. So let's try this. We'll ping the Kali Linux machine from the Raspberry Pi, in fact from a remote session into the Raspberry Pi. So that's the IP address of the Kali Linux machine. And instantly you can see the ICMP packets. So we're definitely capturing traffic from the correct machines here. The next thing we'll do is we'll actually try to telnet from the Kali Linux machine into the Raspberry Pi whilst Wireshark's running and see what we can capture. So from the Kali Linux terminal window, I'll actually minimise that so we can see what's happening in the background. I'll do a control L to clear the screen and we'll try to telnet to the Raspberry Pi on 203.0.113.26 OK, you can actually see already telnet data popping up on the screen there. Then there'll be a little bit of a pause and that pause is just whilst the session is being set up um, the Telnet client and the Telnet server will be trying to work out basically what their um, matching characteristics are and then bang, there we go, the Telnet session is up and running. Notice it says welcome to the Chestnut platform version 2.2 IP address, the host name, we'll log in with Pi and notice that the letters Pi are also echoed back to the screen. We'll use the password of Raspberry And notice that the password was not echoed back to the screen. And while we're in here, we will use the command date, just to check the date and time. And uh, why not use uh, who am I? There we go. And just finish it off with ls minus l and pwd. So we've run a few commands, and then we'll exit. OK, so we've closed the Telnet session. Let's jump back into our Wireshark session. And what we'll do is we'll right click on the Telnet data and go down to Follow TCP Stream. And we've got certain information here regarding setting the sessions up. Uh, but a little bit further down, it should get rather interesting. There we go. That looks familiar, doesn't it? Welcome to the Chestnut platform, the IP address, Kumo RPI1 login. We can also see that the letters are doubled up here because we typed the letter into the terminal and the letter was echoed back to the screen. That's why we get double double letters here. So login was Pi, password was Raspberry. We logged in, you can see I typed the word date, again echoed back to the screen. LS minus L. Um, 
who am I? So this is of course one of the reasons why we do not use Telnet. So we've now set up the Telnet service. The next thing we'll do is we'll set up FTP. I'm going to close that window and we'll set up FTP on an emulated Raspberry Pi. Okay, I'm going to bring up the putty window. This is our remote connection to the emulated Raspberry Pi and what I'm going to do is I'm going to type sudo su. This will permanently, permanently switch me across to being the super user or the root user in other words. Who am I? Tells me your root um, until I type exit and then I'll switch back to the Pi user. I'll type CD just to change to the root user's home directory. CD without anything behind it will always change to your currently logged in user's direct home directory. So I'm now in the root directory, logged in as root in the root directory. And I'll clear the screen with an L. Okay, so that just tidies the screen up a little bit. Um, now in order to run the FTP server, uh, we need to do a little bit of trickery. Uh, let's first of all type um, SS minus TL to see what's running. We can see that we've got HTTP, SSH and Telnet running. Um, the S FTP server that we'll use will be the VSFTPD, the very secure file transfer protocol daemon. However, before we can run the VSFTP server, we do need to make a slight change to a configuration file. So a little bit more Linux magic now. What we will do is we will type in where is VSFTPD. And it tells us that the system binary, in other words the program itself, is in user sbin. In Etsy, in the Etsy folder we've actually got the configuration file. That's what we're interested in. There's also a man page for it as well. So there's a manual page for how it works. I'm now going to nano Nano being a rather nice text editor, Etsy, vsftpd.conf. And in here, you'll see most of the information is actually commented out. Um, we will now see if we can set up the vsftp server. Now, I think what normally stops it working is where we have listen IPv6 equals yes because we have no interfaces set up for IPv6 so generally if you make that line commented out and save it it should now start okay what we also have and this is quite useful is we have local enable equals yes so this means that we can log in as a local user on the system so we can log in for instance as the user pi OK, so all we've done is we've commented out listen underscore IPv6 equals yes. I'm now going to save that with Control O, Enter, and Control X. And then we'll try starting the VSFTPD server. And we can do that using system CTL start VSFTP. And cross your fingers. <laughs> okay, let's check the status on that. Okay, that's actually failed. Okay, so it has actually failed to start. that's okay because this is Linux and Linux is a very flexible operating system and we can fix anything so what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually leave this in the video and we'll see if we can troubleshoot what the problem is. Um, let's have a quick look in that configuration file again. Ah, well, there's the obvious answer. Okay, We need to make sure that the VSFDP server is set to listen. OK, so if it's not listening on, its in on the interfaces, then of course it's not going to be able to start. So 
let's change listen equals no to listen equals yes and then save it with control O enter control X and now let's see if it will start system CTL start VSFTPD okay and check the status and it's now running excellent okay so the two changes we needed to make let's just make sure that you know what they are you need to make sure that it is set listen equals yes and also that listen on IPv6 is commented out because we have no IPv6 enabled interfaces on here and then it should start fine okay um, how can we check that it's listening SS minus TL hey look at that FDP is now listening okay and of course if we wish to see that numerically instead of using TL we can just use TLN okay or we can even use the old command and because I'm logged in as the root user I can get the process that owns these sockets and we can see that uh, Python 3 which was that fancy web server um, owns port 80 VSFTPD port 21, SSHD port 22, and INETD, the Internet Super Server, port 23, Telnet. The only established connection we have at the moment is going to the SSH server, which of course is this window here. Okay, now comes the fun part. Let's see if we can. We'll leave Wireshark running, it should still be running. Uh, we'll go to our Kali Linux machine and we'll see if we can get into the FTP server okay this video is going to probably last for about half an hour but we are covering an awful lot of material now So we opened up the Firefox web browser and we will use FTP as the protocol, colon forward slash forward slash, and that will be 203.0.113.26. Now you can see I've already checked this before and it did work before, so hopefully it should work this time. Hey! Authentication is required. We can log in with the local user in the configuration file we actually had it set to use local users so I'm going to log in with the user pi and the password of raspberry and I don't want to re remember the password so we'll close that and we're logged in um, I'll just have a little look around in here course materials IoT security um, chapter 2 so I'm changing directories and every time I change directories it has to change the directories and then list the contents of the directory to give me this output on the screen images and let's have a look at the netcad.png file oh, hey Cisco Networking Academy superb okay and now what we'll do is we'll just bring up Wireshark and let's see if we can find some FTP information and then we'll close this video down can't see the FTP information at the moment that's because I had it set to follow a TCP stream of, TC, uh, of Telnet from the previous session so what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll apply that filter I probably didn't want to take the entire filter out but um, let's just pop that filter back in again it's amazing what you can do with Wireshark you can learn so much with Wireshark Okay, I think this might be the longest video that we've done, but um, hey, I find some FTP information here. Request list. Request uh, change working directory to home pi notebooks course materials. Chapter IoT security chapter two. And again, we can do the same as we did last time. We can actually pick the FTP session, right-click on it, go to follow TCP stream, 
and there we go the VSFTP D daemon uh, username pi password raspberry oh how dangerous is that never use clear text protocols like FTP or telnet login is successful uh, features for the FTP service print working directory um, switching to binary mode so it's setting the FTP server up now and what we can see is we can see if we go right down the bottom we can see directories being changed to and listings happening as we flick from directory to directory and finally the last thing we did was we uh, pulled across the netacad.png file all 49,160 bytes of it transfer complete okay so what did we do in this video? quite a lot uh, we had a little look at uh, the already running services which was the web server and the SH server. Um, we also set up the INET super server to give us Telnet and we set up the VSFTPD server to give us FTP file transfer protocol. I hope you enjoyed that video and please join me for video number 12 in our foundational series of IoT security Raspberry Pi emulation videos. Thank you very much.